How's that for a slice of fried gold? Are you think this is a fucking costume? This is a way of life. I'll be mad. Just a flesh wound. I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. I'm sorry, Ben. I'm afraid I can't do that. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! I guess everyone's a time of one good scare. Well, hello! <laughs> Welcome to Cinema Shock. It is the podcast where we de- we are dedicated. We dedicate to wow. it's in front of me. It is. You're, you're literally you're literally reading it. You you <laughs> you delayed the start of this episode so that you could look up the intro that you say every week, and now you're still saying it wrong. No, no. Well, what it is is I can see your face, and you do lots of facial expressions. I don't think you know you do, and it just distracts me because it's like you, it's always disappointment. <laughs> that's just that's my default uh, anyway we're cinema shock we're the podcast dedicated to exploring the stories behind your favorite cult and genre films i am one of your hosts gary horn hey i'm justin bishop we are joined as always by mr todd a davis i'm so excited i wish i had three microphones Woo! <laughs> it's a three boob <laughs> joke <laughs> Or it's a reference to the boobs, the the triple boobs. Gary I got really. He said he wished he had three hands, but he really did have three hands. How about that? Hey. Hey, one of them was fake, though. So uh, one of them was a robot hand, so not really his hand. So I don't think that counts. Was it an alien hand? Well, yeah, but he had a robot hand. That he took off. Oh, that's right. That's right. And okay. revealed the alien hand. Yes. Yeah. So. Well, son of a bitch. Yeah, son of a bitch. You guys notice how much Verhoeven likes to just pulverized dicks does i I did read that uh arnie wore a cup for a lot of those scenes well i would hope so yes (laughs) uh but yeah his dick gets just destroyed by sharon stone in this to be Uh, fair not 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 the way that you want that to happen to be fair it's not a cup he was wearing a bucket (laughs) <laughs> but also you know in robocop that guy got shot in the dick and remember yeah. in one of one of i think it was in like turkish delight rudger Hauer like zips his dick up into his zipper oh, that's right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah he's just got a thing for dick violence i guess oh, <laughs> need to look up and see if anybody's ever asked him about that on an interview yeah maybe we can get him on the show and that'll get be him the first on question hey what's with <laughs> you and hurting dicks first things first <laughs> mr verhoven <laughs> <laughs> let's get down to the nitty gritty sir sometimes it seems like you may not like women that much or penises so just i, I think generally people yeah. why uh, are you so mean to dick meat <laughs> dick meat <laughs> well so obviously we are continuing our paul verhoven series uh so this is our third episode in the series and we're m- moving on with his part two of his uh i guess sci-fi trilogy you could call yeah. it. Uh, we started last week with RoboCop. You know, when we, uh, as we've talked about this series, we've kind of talked about the Ver- Verhoeven's background. We talked a little bit back in our Flesh and Blood episode about his experience, you know, in Holland and what brought him to America. And as we talked about then, you know, when when Paul Verhoeven moved to America, his goal was to make films that appeal to the American audience. And it's pretty safe to say that he did that. You know, we talked about RoboCop's success last week uh, but with robocop paul verhoeven created an american pop culture icon uh, he created a summer blockbuster that doubled as a scathing satire of american culture and basically with that one movie with a single film he propelled himself into the hollywood a-list so it's no big surprise that you know in the wake of that film's success he caught the attention of some of the biggest names in hollywood and then in the late 1980s nobody in hollywood was bigger both metaphorically and literally than Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was at the height of his stardom. And when Schwarzenegger saw RoboCop, he knew immediately that Paul Verhoeven was the guy that he wanted to helm his next project, which was a long gestating Philip K. Dick adaptation called, of course, Total Recall. Your mind, it is the center of your life. 
It is everything you hear. Everything you see. Everything you feel. It is everything you are. How would you know if someone stole your mind? Quaid. Cut. Get ready for a surprise. We can't let him run around. He knows too much. Welcome to Mars. You got a lot of nerve showing your face around here. Look who's talking. If I'm not me, who the hell am I? You wouldn't hurt me. After all, we're married. Consider that a divorce. We hope you enjoyed the ride. Just as an FYI, this whole movie doesn't happen without Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like, if he's not involved, it just doesn't. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're going to get into the development of this because uh, there was a long, long development history on this one. But uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, without Arnold's involvement, this movie may not have ever existed. The more you read about the movie, the more you see just how much he just like basically willed it or asserted powered it into existence. Uh, yeah. So many stories of things aren't going right. You just run to Daddy Arnold and he says <laughs> he wants something and then it happens. Development history on Total Recall dated all the way back to the mid-1970s. Uh, if you are a longtime listener of the show, then you may remember from our Dan O'Bannon series a few months ago that the project originated with O'Bannon and his alien screenwriter, Ronald Shusett. So Shusett had actually began pursuing the project uh, even before he and Dan O'Bannon ever teamed up to write Alien. He had first encountered the 23-page Philip K. Dick short story called We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, in the pages of the April 1966 issue of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. And he loved it. He loved the story. And as soon as he read it, he immediately thought that it would make a great movie. So he started moving on that and he paid only a thousand dollars for the rights to the story. Wow. Yeah. I mean, specifically, I think I read it was like 1974. So a good, like 16 years at least before this movie. Uh, well, ever that, that's when happened. he, that's when he started, I think, fully writing it, but he had read it years, years earlier. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is when he, like, optioned the story, I think. Right, like, originally. right, yeah. And uh, this was before Blade Runner, and Philip K. Dick at the time was relatively unknown, because Philip K. Dick, uh, he was not like, I mean, we all know his name now. He's kind of become an iconic, legendary sci-fi writer. But before Blade Runner, like, he was kind of just considered a pulp writer like a lot of his stuff like the story that total recall is based on appeared in magazines mm -hmm. uh the short stories would just be published in magazines and uh his name didn't really have any weight at the time but dan o'bannon being the you know kind of sci-fi nerd that he was he was familiar with philip k dick's work and familiar with this particular short story and he agreed with Shusset that it would make the basis of a fantastic film uh, so the two began to work together on the script but after about 30 pages, they get about 30 pages into the script and O'Bannon realizes that he'd pretty much already scripted nearly every aspect of Dick's story. And he said, and this is a quote from O'Bannon, he said, Dick's story is short. It ends very abruptly. You cannot take that particular story and simply inflate it up to a full length piece. So essentially he saw the short story as like the first act of a film. And then the second and third acts, they would have to be invented from scratch. So he brings this idea up to Ron Shusett. Ron Shusett liked the idea, but then he's like, okay, we get to the end of the short story in the script, and where does it go from here? To which O'Bannon replied, we actually take him to Mars. So this version of the script, when they, they start working it out, it begins with our main character, whose name is Quail in this one, uh, dreaming of a Martian pyramid that he's a, he's got no conscious memory of ever having visited. And that, that name... By the way, it was eventually changed to Quaid because they didn't want to see it as a reference to the then Vice President Dan Quayle. They didn't want it to be seen as like some sort of political statement or anything, you know? Yeah. Uh, so they changed it to Quaid. And uh, here is how Dan O'Bannon describes that early script. Uh, this is a quote. Quaid, Earth's top secret agent, went to Mars and entered this alien compound. The machine killed him and created a synthetic duplicate. He is that synthetic duplicate, and he cannot be killed because he can anticipate danger before it happens. 
Earth wants to kill him, but cannot. And that's why they go to all this trouble to erase his brain to make him think he's nobody. It's the only way they can control him. Uh, obviously, that ha- it is not really what we see in the final film at all. And we'll, we'll discuss all the various script changes on that. But you can see the basis of it here. You know, that, that whole struggling with identity. Uh, and it gives a pretty good reason as to why they would erase his memory and not just murder the guy. Right. Uh, because they can't he's unkillable then at the end of the script uh quaid he puts his hand on the martian machine uh, which like we see in the movie at which point he achieves total recall uh where he discovers his true identity a Mar- he was a martian machine uh here's how o'bannon put it once again he says he is in effect the resurrection of the martian race in a synthetic body he turns and says to all the other characters it's going to be fun to play god and that was kind of the end of the, the story, which wow. is sort of a rad ending, honestly. Yeah, that's pretty uh, cool. But Ron Chusset, he wanted a more dramatic and externalized ending. Uh, Ron Chusset, as we'll discover on this, he's kind of very into the typical Hollywood structure. I, I guess it's, I think that's safe to say. Mm. Uh, and the two of him, him and Dan O'Bannon, never really saw eye to eye on how the movie should end. And uh, O'Bannon says, in true Dan O'Bannon fashion, we, we're big fans of Dan O'Bannon here on the show. I mean, we did a whole series, but I think we can all agree he's kind of a grump. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what he said about the, the finished product. He says, quote, the end that they filmed, in my estimation, is lame. So the writing of this script, uh, the writing of this version was all happening before and simultaneously to the writing of Alien, which eventually took all their attention. Go back and listen to that series, uh, the episode on Alien. Basically, the reason that they chose to move forward with Alien, though, is that they thought that it would be easier to do on a lower, on a smaller budget than Total Recall. Total Recall had, I mean, you're going to Mars. You know, it's going to, it's going to require a lot more special effects and a much bigger budget. And, you know, as screenwriters who are just getting started, they thought they'd have a better chance of getting Alien off the ground, which honestly, they, that was probably a good call. So they, they work on Alien, and we all, of course, know how that story ends. Alien did incredibly well, and the success of that film led to a development deal at Disney for Ron Chousset, and it was there, working at Disney, he had an office on the Disney lot, that he began, uh, that he, he set out to work on Total Recall once again. He wanted to move back onto that project. Eventually, Disney passed on it, and Dino De Laurentiis stepped in to produce. When Disney uh, backed out, was it the three boobs? They... I don't think the three boobs weren't there yet. I don't think. Oh, okay. That was going to be their logo, for God's sake. That was <laughs> it. They were into that. <laughs> Mickey's Mickey's ears, not completely unlike boobs. She was going to be, she was just going to be, she was going to have the bow tie or bow, uh, yeah, on top of her head, like the bow. It would be great. The little Minnie Mouse. Yeah. <laughs> they um, were going to dub her. Ah, you want to you squeeze this? <laughs> I had actually <laughs> muted myself, but I was going to say, I found a um, quote from O'Bannon just uh, before we wrap him up basically out of this story. But he, uh, yeah, because he, <laughs> he, he gets screenwriting credit, but yes, he, uh, he's not super involved after this point. Yeah, I found a really good interview with him. And for God's sake, I think it was Den of Geek, but I can't remember exactly where I saw it at. So I apologize to whoever. But anyway, it's, a, it's decently long quote but i'm sorry but here it goes roddy really didn't know what to do with it he wasn't really comfortable with me writing the whole thing because well call him and ask him yourself he'll tell you the deal the only thing that's important to him is his name above the title he brought this over to me and he said do you think this could be a full-length screenplay i know the story well and i said i sure do i sat down and immediately batted out the first 30 pages handed it to him on the basis of that he said write some more and i did and i said this is good for a first act but for the movie you can't come up with you're, you got to come up with two more acts. So this is basically all what Justin just covered. It seemed, he said, it seems obvious to me that the guy has to go to Mars now because this whole obsession with being James Bond on Mars. I said that I thought the rest of the movie should be a cross between Casablanca and James Bond. He said, I don't agree at all. I think it should be a Western on Mars, you know, like Pancho Villa on Mars. I said, that's a terrible idea. I'm not writing that. And he went <laughs> off and he found some other schmozzle to write it as a Western on schmozzle. Mars. Yeah, I, th- I think that's what word this is. <laughs> so after some months, he goes back to me saying he wrote it, but that nobody likes it. And he was very willing to try my approach. So I wrote another act and got him to Mars. And I continued with that lighthearted, imagine the best of the Bond movies, Goldfinger or something. I continued in that tone. I figured 
what the third act should be. And at that point, Ronnie yanked it away from me again and ran off and again got some other guy to write a third act. Everybody hated it. So he came back again. I sat down and wrote the third act at his request. Ronnie took it away. Years passed while he ran around town trying to do deal making. He finally got the picture financed and then others now involved completely rewrote the third act into what I consider incoherence. So the first two acts are more or less Phil Dick and me. And the last act is Ronnie Chassette. As I watch the movie, everything it's built, been building up to the last 20 minutes or so just crumbles into complete chaos. Despite all that, though, later Dan, on... In Dan O'Bannon just tells it like it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, I will say, despite all that, in that interview later on, he does describe, as far as his quote-unquote original stories, Alien and Total Recall as his most gratifying um, that he got a chance to work on. Uh, he said he, he managed some good turns in those stories that satisfied him. Uh, he said, the world doesn't always get to see some of the turns I make because other people kicked them out of the movie, but as scripts, these two stories were pretty satisfying. Yeah, so that, that third act seems like it, you know, that, that they kept rewriting, that Dan O'Bannon kept rewriting and other writers kept rewriting. Uh, it seemed like that was always the biggest hurdle in writing the script. And once they got, once Disney passed and Dino De Laurentiis stepped in, uh, that still was the case. Uh, they were still having issues with that, the ending of the film, basically. But De Laurentiis, he, he picked up the project and he was kind of hoping that his choice for the director of the project would help to solve those issues. That was a guy by the name of David Cronenberg, hot off the mainstream success of The Dead Zone. He and, uh, so, he, he and, uh, Verhoeven just like crisscross paths all the time don't they yeah I mean I it makes sense though honestly like they they have similar sensibilities only uh, I, I feel like Verhoeven's lean a little more towards like Hollywood tropes like using using uh, the story to kind of subvert Hollywood tropes whereas Cronenberg's not particularly concerned with that kind of stuff you know right. but there's all the weird there's a lot of weird subversiveness a lot of body horror stuff you know uh, obviously with Cronenberg, that's a bigger thing, but yeah, they, they, they seem like, like two sides of the same coin almost to me. Mm. So, uh, Cronenberg comes in, he reads the script. He loves the beginning of it, which he called pure Philip K. Dick, but he didn't think that she said no band and really know where to go with the story, the further along that it got. So Cronenberg spends a year writing and rewriting his own version of the script, uh, and this time period in which Cronenberg says he wrote about 12 drafts of the, of the script himself, uh, he, that time period was often spent fighting with Ronald Shusett about it. And at a certain point, Shusett said to him, you know what you've done? You've done the Philip K. Dick version. To which Cronenberg replied, well, yeah. <laughs> and Shusett <laughs> goes, uh, no, no, no. We want Raiders of the Lost Ark goes to Mars. That's why Shusette saw it as an adventure film, something less serious than, say, Ridley Scott's somber take on Blade Runner, uh, a point of view that De Laurentiis kind of shared as well. But David Cronenberg did not. <laughs> and he left the project telling Dino De Laurentiis, I don't want to make your movie, and it seems you don't want to make my, my movie, so we should just stop. And according to Ronald Shusette, the problems with Cronenberg began around the time that uh, Richard Dreyfus actually started showing interest in the role. So you got to think where Richard Dreyfus was in his career around this time. He was already an Oscar winner. Uh, he had just come off of the success of Jaws and Close Encounters of the Third Time. And he wanted, uh, O'Bannon and Shusette, he wanted them to mold the character of Quaid to better fit his sort of everyman persona rather than the action hero they'd written. But honestly, the everyman persona, uh, it kind of fits in with the character in the short story a little bit better than what they turned him into. A lot of a lot of Dick's um, protagonists are kind of that everyman. Yeah, and so Cronenberg, his version, he kind of describes what it might have looked like. This is a quote from David Cronenberg. First of all, I really wanted to cast William Hurt, and the difference between Bill Hurt and Arnold Schwarzenegger probably tells you everything. I was doing something that I thought was faithful to Phil Dick and also my own sense of the complex understanding of what memory is and what identity is. Uh, so he's looking for something a little bit deeper, maybe, than Ron Shusett's looking for. And although Cronenberg never received any sort of writing credit on the final film, there are elements of his script that were retained. Uh, it should be no surprise to anyone who's familiar with Cronenberg's work that his biggest contributions to the final film were the idea of mutants on Mars, 
<laughs> and Kuwatu's uh, malformed twin, you know, coming out of the stomach, neither of which appears in the original story. Those were inventions of David Cronenberg, which, you know, as, as the sort of body horror master that he is, yeah. uh, seems, seems pretty obvious. If someone were to show me this movie and go, pick out something that you think Dave, came from David Cronenberg's brain, that's exactly what I would pick. <laughs> yeah, what's crazy about this, though, I mean, it works out uh, well for filmdom because, uh, I mean, I shouldn't say this for part of what I'm about to say, but originally, you know, David Cronenberg was uh, was offered the fly and turned it down when he was working on this. And yeah. uh, and I think that got picked up by Rip uh, Robert Bierman was the person that was originally going to direct it. And then his daughter died. And that was around the same time that Cronenberg was leaving total recall and just throwing his hands up on that. And oh wow. So he, he got the opportunity to step back into the fly uh role. So it, you know, it, as fate would have it, then we got that awesome remake of the fly. But yeah. It's funny how those things work out like that sometimes though, you know. Uh because would I have loved to see a David Cronenberg version of this movie? Yeah. But would I sacrifice the greatness that is the fly for that? Probably not. I mean, maybe if the version <laughs> of this that we had gotten had sucked, but the version that we got didn't suck. So we still got a great version of this story, you know. Uh, and later in the development process, Cronenberg says that De Laurent has actually approached him and offered the project to him again. And this time he's like, okay, well, you can do it the way that you want to do it. But Cronenberg declined. Uh, he didn't want to sub su subject himself to regular arguments with Ron Shusett again. Seems like Ronald Shusett, we talked about how difficult O'Bannon was back in that series. But it seems like Ron Shusett is not the easiest guy to work with either, honestly. Yeah, they're peas in a pod. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they do not get along very well, it seems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, despite the fact that they obviously they cranked out one of the best you know, horror movies of all time, but still, it, it doesn't seem like they're the best of friends. And maybe, no. <laughs> maybe that's just a consequence of having worked together closely and they just got annoyed with each other, yeah. like I do with you guys sometimes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, but so Cronenberg he was one of the most high profile directors attached to the project but he certainly wasn't the only one uh, Richard Rush who had directed the stuntman who I think we referenced on our Toby Hooper series a while back uh, he was attached at one point but he and De Laurentiis couldn't agree on the third act once again and another director that De Laurentiis approached was Bruce uh, Beresford who's a prolific Australian director who had planned on shooting the film at De Laurentiis' studio in his native Australia uh, with Patrick Swayze, who had just done Dirty Dancing. So he was hot. Uh, Patrick Swayze was going to play Quaid in it. Best uh, possible version. I, well, I mean, that's... <laughs> it, <laughs> I would definitely... I don't know much about Beresford's filmography, so I can't say how... This, this seems like an a weird choice based on the other movies of his that I looked up on IMDb. Uh, but who knows? I mean, you know, I mean, Cronenberg had not done anything sci-fi related prior to RoboCop and fucking killed it, you know? So who knows what he could have done with it throughout the thing. There are actors. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I saw the names of Jeff Bridges, Matthew Broderick at one point, you mentioned uh, Richard Dreyfuss. Man, saw Matthew Mark Broderick would have been pretty young. I mean, this is yeah. like not, not long after, Ferris Bueller, where he yeah. was a high school student. Oh, weird. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. I saw Tom Selleck in one thing. Uh, Christopher Reeve, I saw in there too. That's just That'd been cool. Yeah, just yeah. A I lot mean, of none names. of those are terrible choices, honestly. <laughs> yeah, uh, any of those could work, especially with the everyman kind of aspect of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the the version with Patrick Swayze was the, really the closest to getting made. I mean, they. Beresford was hard at work on the project. He went through pre-production. He built sets. Like they were getting ready to shoot this thing when the rug got pulled out from under him, when Dina De Laurentiis' uh, production company filed for bankruptcy and lost all their money. So they actually, they, they just, he had a phone call and they're like, it's done. We had to, they had to start tearing down sets. Uh, Beresford bounced back though, because his next film was the multiple Academy Award winner, Driving Miss Daisy. Weird swerve yeah. from Total Recall <laughs> to Driving Miss Daisy, but he did okay for himself. So this was around 1987, okay? Uh, so still a few years until the final product. And it was around this time in 1987 that another screenwriter, a guy named Gary Goldman, got involved. Goldman had made his name a year earlier with a screenplay for John Carpenter's Big Trouble in Little China. Hey. He maybe even possibly 
might be uh, responsible for the iconic line, <laughs> oh, may yeah. the wings of liberty never lose a feather. That's a good point. I didn't think about yeah, that. Yeah, thanks, Gary Goldman. And a guy named Gary said it. How oh. about that? It's, it's like it's <laughs> fate. <laughs> uh, so he had been asked to do a polish on the script. Uh, he read the script and liked it, uh, but he initially did turn it down because uh, he was in the middle of working on his own project, which was an out-of-body action movie that he had co-written and was producing called Warrior. And the guy who was supposed to direct that film just happened to be Paul Verhoeven. And that project never happened. Uh, the screenplay just never got to the point where Verhoeven was ready to move forward on it for whatever reason. But in the meantime, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who had been circling Total Recall kind of ever since Patrick Swayze left the project or since that version of the project kind of fell apart, he found out that his old Conan the Barbarian collaborator, Dino De Laurentiis, was having some financial trouble and that the project had pretty much you know, imploded essentially. Mm. Uh, so he calls Dino, their old friend, you know, they did a couple of movies together, very successful movies. And he asked him if his company would be willing to sell the rights to Philip K. Dick's story. When De Laurentiis agreed, Schwarzenegger called two other past collaborators, Andrew G. Vajna and Mario Casa, who were the owners of Carol Co., uh, who had produced Red Heat for Arnold. And he, he suggested that they buy it. So like Arnold's, making moves you know he gets dino to give up the rights he gets these other guys to buy the rights all that arnold's doing is convincing other people to sell stuff to other people yeah, <laughs> you dino. Know? yeah. In, in the commentary he um per him he'd he'd seen verhoven in a restaurant interrupted him and whoever he was with to gush about robocop it was actually right yeah. after robocop said he saw him at lunch and he said he just like barged over it was like you know, like I'm not nearly as good as Todd on this. Just like, do it. You know, Just do it. You know, you got it in you. Come on. Ah, come on, Paul. I love this so much. You got to go with me and do the, the movies. I want to work together. <laughs> wow, so, you just turned. Um, I know. I, I, I uh, my, German my or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, then he says he saw Dino was going bankrupt later on. Immediately called his buddy no, uh, no. Mario Costa no, no. <laughs> and <laughs> Andrew Vanya and said. Buy this movie now. <laughs> and they did. Get your Do ass it. to the bank. <laughs> and he said he immediately <laughs> called Verhoeven and was like, remember that lunch? This is the project. Sign up. Let's do this. Yeah, they, they work, up, love working with Karolko. Yeah, they. there's a really great, if you've got that Total Recall 4K, there's a really great documentary that's about an hour long. That's not even about Total Recall specifically, but about Karolko, mm. uh, like their history oh, and how they kind of, shaped hollywood oh that's uh, so really weird i, I did really get cool. it but i didn't get a chance to watch that one but yeah uh, check it out when you get a chance it's i think you'd find it interesting because they talk about you know the rambo movies and stuff like that uh but so yeah these guys buy the movie from from uh, dana de Laurentiis for about three million dollars and this happens within a matter of hours of like arnold getting on the phone with dino then arnold getting on the phone with these guys like this a few hours later they own the rights to it like he, nice. he he made this start moving pretty fast he was ready to move forward on it no i was just going to say not to not to hammer on it too much but just because it'll be relevant for as we continue this series i mean uh arnold gushes about carl co uh just loving them during red heat and then um and then you know verhoven is is going to continue to work with them after this and going yeah. into basic instinct and even somewhat in showgirls so uh, it just I don't know. Anyway, and I think Arnold does. I think they do T two, if I'm not mistaken, too. They did. Yeah, yeah I yeah, thought I, I thought so. They did some of the Terminators. Yeah, Schwarzenegger. You know, he'd been a big fan of RoboCop, so he essentially handpicked Verhoeven. Like he, like Gary said, they, he confronted him at lunch. He's like, "You got to take a look at this." Uh, and then, interestingly enough, Ronald Shusett claims that he had been eyeing Verhoeven for the director way back when he was trying to set up the film at Disney. Uh, here's a quote from Shusett. He says. In 1981, eight years before I got the movie financed, I wanted Paul to direct it. I'd just seen Soldier of Orange, and I said, that's the guy I want. His agent said she gave him the script, but it, that he doesn't like science fiction. And then about seven years later, he fell in love with science fiction and made RoboCop. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's from Ronald Shusett's point of view. Who knows if it exactly happened that way? But Shusett claims that, hey, I had, I had this Verhoeven guy in mind years ago, you know, for this movie. <laughs> But Verhoeven did eventually read the script and according to Shusette, didn't even have to finish it before signing on. He got to the scene where Dr. Edgemar says, 
you're not really here. You're asleep in the chair and at recall. And then he closed his script, called his agent, called Schwarzenegger and said, I'm in, I'm doing this. Nice. Which is the funny part of th- that about that to me, when she said, tells that story is that everything we've heard about this so far up to this point is that everyone has an issue with the third act of the script. And Shusset claims that Verhoeven signed on before even getting to that part of the movies. <laughs> so who, uh, you know, who knows what was going on? It is a pretty, that, that is point. a pretty trippy, that is a pretty trippy scene in the movie where well, the I guy think, shows I, up and it's like, cause I mean, there's not, and the fun part about it is, is there's not really a lot of special effects involved there. It's just yeah. a conversation. And if you've been paying attention, like you're going to start questioning, like, is it, is he or no? No, it is. No, but is it? <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably the point in the script where Verhoeven realized what kind of mind games he could play with yeah. this, you know, because that, that's where that's what he seems to really have fun with. Oh, yeah, for sure. So after Verhoeven was hired, Gary Goldman told him the story about turning down the chance to rewrite Total Recall because, you know, they'd been working together. Uh, he's like, yeah, I, I, had, I turned down the chance to rewrite that movie because I wanted to work with you. And then that movie didn't happen. So Verhoeven... Uh, later hires Goldman to do rewrites on the script after all. So he still got to work on Total Recall and with Verhoeven. Uh, So it worked out pretty well for him. And by this time, there had been dozens of screenplays uh, credited to Shusette and O'Bannon, Shusette and Star Trek, the motion picture screenwriter, John Povell, uh, who does get a screenwriting or or a story credit, I believe it is on this. Mm. Uh, There was one... uh, credited to Shusset and Stephen Pressfield. Uh, like Verhoeven read all of these. Uh, so he reads all of these versions of the script and he sent Goldman the ones that he wanted him to read. He's like, these are the ones that have all the best ideas. Let's go from here. And the problem in almost all of them was the second half. Everything kind of after that Dr. Edgemar scene. So Goldman's job was to adjust everything to kind of make that second half work better mm-hmm. and to reconfigure the story to fit Arnold Schwarzenegger since in all the previous drafts, Quaid was kind of a more mild-mannered guy, not necessarily a guy who looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Per Verhoeven, uh, Verhoeven uh, like there were, like you said, I mean, he said there, there were at least 30 versions of the script before they got it. And again, like what you're covering, he says Gary Goldman was, it was that third act. He was like mainly working on the third act stuff. And uh, he even brought Goldman and Chassette onto the set the whole time. They, they yeah. sat in with him. And I think initially they'd even welcomed Dan O'Bannon, but he had kind of had a falling out with Paul Verhoeven when they started talking about it, when he'd seen. Happens a uh, lot with Dan O'Bannon. Yeah. He said he'd (laughs) seen that uh, Verhoeven had replaced all the satirical humor he'd intended and all that stuff and put in so much extreme violence, uh, which happens a lot with Verhoeven. And uh, and, uh, so in the original, apparently it was like more dark humor and, you know, all of that stuff. But Verhoeven felt like this other way, uh, kind of what you were saying, just uh, Verhoeven recognized the necessity to kind of tailor it to Arnold Schwarzenegger. And so he fit yeah. more in this mold. Well, he also, Verhoeven also starts making some decisions when it comes to like helping to shape where the script is going to go that really decided the direction of, of what the movie would become. Uh, the first major one that he made, the first major decision that Verhoeven w- made was that he wanted to make the movie as if Dr. Edgemar might be telling the truth that maybe everything we see after that point really is Quaid's fantasy. So Mm -hmm. Goldman had to reconfigure everything so that the movie could be read both ways, that everything happening to Quaid could be real or that it could all be part of the secret agent fantasy that's been implanted by recall. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that, I mean, that, that obviously is an element of the original story, but Verhoeven wanted it to be able to be seen like you could watch the movie with one way in mind or the other way in mind and it would work both ways and another key element that Goldman introduced was the idea that uh, that Quaid's real identity Hauser is in on the whole thing like this was not in previous scripts before Gary Goldman got involved which is another very important story point I think important to how the movie reads overall it forces Quaid to make an interesting moral choice which does he want to be his true authentic self, but be evil or be his artificial self and be good? Uh, it's a really interesting quandary. And it's one that feels very true to the film's origin as a Philip K. Dick story. Oh yeah. Then there was only one more st- story hurdle left to tackle. So after Goldman had completed his first rewrite, 
the Carol Coheads, met with Schwarzenegger, Verhoeven, Schusset, Goldman, uh, everyone involved. Uh, and Schusset and Schwarzenegger kind of felt that the finale lacked emotion. They need, they wanted something more emotional towards the end. And that actually led to Goldman's idea about Cohagen shutting off the air and suffocating the mutants because you sympathize with them. And it adds a whole nother element to rooting for Quaid to win at the end because not only is, you know, he's uncovering all this, but he's also literally saving the lives of, you know, hundreds or thousands of, of Martians. Yeah. So they get all this stuff done. Uh, the script gets made with all these changes in effect. And with all this done, the film goes into production in Mexico. Part of the reason Mexico works really well in this movie is they use the, the new brutalism architecture. They talk a lot about that in the commentary. And I never noticed that before I started looking it up and it's, it's kind of interesting, like just, uh, the way all those buildings look stone and, you know, yeah, like brutalism like prisons. Was, um, if you look at old Nazi architecture, uh, like those really, you know, striking kind of everything's like stark lines boxed off like that. That's brutalism. I don't know the difference between that and new brutalism necessarily, but it's very similar. Uh, and I, and I think if, if you look at old like USSR stuff and things like that, you see a lot of brutalism as well, which I think mm -hmm. that was probably, an intentional kind of comparison for Verhoeven here. Yeah. And we didn't, I mean, I don't know if you were going to get to it or not. So sorry if I'm jumping ahead, but the, uh, I mean, just the, the other stuff they did here. I mean, we've talked mostly about Arnold, but the casting in this movie is amazing. Like uh, I love everybody in this movie. Yeah. There's an incredible cast. I mean, you've got obviously Sharon Stone, who this was fairly early in her career. I mean, she'd done a lot by this point, but nothing like big. Um, I, I think it's safe to say that probably her next movie with Paul Verhoeven is the movie that made her like a movie star. Yeah. But this movie uh, is the know, where he saw her, that he was like right. the way she could turn it on and off, like be sweet and then get really evil looking. He was, he yeah. was very impressed with her. Um, he, he definitely talks a little bit about that. And Arnold loved her cause she was like ready to get in there on the stunts. I think she's inducted into the stunt woman association hall of fame as an honorary oh, yeah. member or something because she was in there like doing everything in this movie that's cool and then michael ironside who i, I think we're probably all big fans of i that was the uh, next guy i definitely wanted to mention yeah. yeah he's amazing and you have to wonder if his I, involvement is uh, coincidental or if somehow he became involved when Cronenberg was circling the project because they had worked together like on scanners. I, I wonder if that's just a coincidence. Um, in the commentary, um, I'm sorry, I keep referring back to it, but I just want to make sure. Yeah, you know, fine, I, yeah. I just don't know this stuff off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> when I was talking to, when I called- You heard up, it somewhere but, is what you're saying. Yes, when I called you. Verhoeven up, I was like, um, <laughs> anyway, no, he, apparently Ironside was, I know we mentioned him in RoboCop, but apparently he was like really in there. Like they were, they, he almost was filmed and he as RoboCop as RoboCop, Murphy. but they couldn't agree on the script. They kept arguing about everything. And so he and Verhoeven fought a lot on that. So finally it was just like, this isn't going to work. You got to go. And so <laughs> Ironside left, but when he was doing this movie, he said he still loved Ironside and wanted to use him really, really badly. And so he, called him uh again and got him in this role uh yeah. some some rumors said that you know like uh what's his face uh kurt kurt uh you know or what smith yeah i was gonna say that 70s show guy uh he <laughs> they Pilgrim. almost considered it and he didn't want to do it that much because he felt like it was too much like the robocop role for him oh, to yeah. do this i could see that yeah. yeah and so uh yeah i could see that ironside was was in on this and uh well i mean i love michael ironside and, and this is not the last time we'll see him in a verhoven movie either you know he'll show back up later on down the line the other thing that i thought was very sweet about this uh, there was a story about how uh michael ironside was on set and it's so weird to think about this because he's he plays this role so mean and so tough but apparently in between takes he would always be on his phone and arnold finally kept wondering why he was on his phone and went over and asked him and apparently his sister was on having she had cancer during the filming and so he was constantly calling his sister talking to her and checking in and they said that arnold grabbed michael and pulled him to his trailer says you you got to come with me and pulled him in there and he they made him call her sister put on a speaker and he started giving her 
all the advice about the exercises she should be doing and mm. uh, the diet plan and stuff and like started checking in with her too and, like trying Arnold to, was yeah Arnold, Arnold was yeah and stuff so Art said said he's never forgotten about that that's awesome I mean Arnold yeah, that's cool I mean he's a I'm sure there are stories. I mean, we obviously know he cheated on his wife and stuff, but so he's not, he's not a perfect human, but he seems like a generally kind of good dude to me, you know, yeah. uh, like you hear, cause you hear stories like that a lot about him. I mean, he's got a big ego for sure. As when someone becomes the biggest movie star in the world is going to happen. Right. <laughs> but, right. Uh, but he does seem like a nice, like people tell stories like that about him. It seems like a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Total Recall, you know, Total Recall goes before cameras, and it is not only the most expensive film that Verhoeven has ever made, its budget is actually more than the combined cost of all of Verhoeven's previous films, including Robocop. And at $48 $48 million, this is 1990, $48 million, it's at that time in 1990, it's one of the most expensive films ever made, period. Uh, And and the you know, $48 million is what it went before cameras with a budget of, but the complex action scenes and the special effects, like it actually eventually Eight. led to a final budget of closer to 55 million. Yeah. 500 people worked on this film. Uh, they built 45 sets, tied up eight sound stages for six months. And uh, yeah, I think it was, you said period. It was the second most expensive film in history next to Rambo three. I think is what it's I so read. weird that Rambo three is bigger than this one, because I mean, that, that movie's, <laughs> filled with giant explosions and stuff and obviously big special effects helicopters and stuff but this one feels like it should be more expensive yeah <laughs> yeah it really does sure. but you were right i mean i mean Chisette and dano bannon that they that's what they predicted they they said when they were making it they just felt it was probably going to be too expensive and difficult to make yeah and you're uh, right <laughs> so they put it aside for alien which worked yeah. out fine but and it was difficult to make too i mean like like you said it's shooting on what'd you say six sound stages or so yeah mm, like that's a lot i mean and, and this is in mexico yeah. and during that time as it's shooting much of the casting crew spent a lot of their time rushing to the toilet or visiting studio doctors having been struck by montezuma's revenge oh yeah mm. i learned my i learned the rules back on the predator so i didn't have much of a problem <laughs> <laughs> that's true Arnold Schwarzenegger didn't have a problem uh, he was one of the only people who didn't get sick because he had his food flown in from LA every day and prepared for him in his trailer by a personal chef Ron there's really says no, that he didn't there's really no other either. way to do it honestly <laughs> yeah. if one could afford to do that I guess you're right <laughs> right yeah him and the yeah. rock <laughs> uh, and at one point Verhoeven was so dehydrated from diarrhea and vomiting that he had to be put on an IV drip and direct a scene from an ambulance stretcher saying quote unless I'm dying we're not going to stop shooting <laughs> or maybe I should have let, let Gary say that <laughs> <laughs> unless I'm dying I'm not going to quit shooting <laughs> wait shooting or shitting <laughs> you are, unless i unless i am dying we i'm not gonna stop shitting <laughs> there it is, there it is. <laughs> that's, that's, that's basically what he said so uh yeah the uh the movie is riddled with stories of weird stuff like this just that was the only other person by the way who, according to Shusette, yes. Yeah, Which, Shusette. I, I, t- I feel like I want to take everything he says with a grain of salt. I don't know why. I just don't <laughs> trust him. Yeah, because his story is that he basically t- took like B12, had like a regular B12 shot. Yeah. He boiled all of his water constantly and stuff like that with everything. Maybe you know, he did, he but teeth, I don't know. <laughs> he said like people yeah. made fun of him all the time that he was like being overly paranoid till they all got sick. So yeah, yeah who knows? <laughs> uh, Arnold, though, I mean, there was other stuff like... Michael Ironside cracked his rib uh, in the elevator fight scene. Oh, and yeah, he uh, lost his arms too. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that was brutal. Uh, <laughs> He's a also loses him later in Starship Troopers too, I think. Yeah, well, or at yeah. least one. Yeah. So yeah, he true does. sacrifice for one's craft. Yeah. He just, uh, <laughs> well, it, now, now it takes it away. It takes away a little bit from Starship Troopers because now I know he really didn't have them going in. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, he had to wear a rib guard the whole time afterwards that borrowed from some like uh, quarterback that uh, happened to be working on set of former quarterback or something like that. But uh, Arnold, like when he's chasing down the subway, like when he's getting chased and he uh, 
bust out the window to like jump in the subway window. He, yeah. uh, the glass was supposed to explode and it didn't. So he just really smashed the window open <laughs> and he like <laughs> slid his hand up. <laughs> and, uh, oh, Lord. so he said it was like right at lunchtime too. So they had to like take him and, uh, stitch him up during lunch. And then he had to come right back from lunch and do the same scene again. They had to reshoot it. <laughs> so it was, uh, just a weird, weird thing. Uh, Oh, he was in the fight scene where he kills the doctor in that, uh, you know, the one that, that created the program that comes to visit him. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he's killing him, he had to, he broke his finger and he had to wear a cast the rest of the shoot. And so hmm. that hand is just kept out of frame, like in the scenes they shot after that. Oh, wow. But yeah, yeah I mean, and it... uh, oh, I'm sorry. And uh, Bill Sandell, uh, the pr production designer, he, um, he said that there was like horrible air like the air quality was just terrible in mexico city and uh, mm. he said it was like smoking two packs of cigarettes a day oh, uh, geez. he geez. said that at one point their associate producer elliot schick had to be uh, taken to a medical evac helicopter off the set to go to the hospital geez. they said verhoven afterwards yeah he just had the ambulance nearby at all times <laughs> just kept it there yeah <laughs> wow I mean, some of the hardest working members of the crew were the film's special effects designers and technicians uh, because this was you know total recall was one of the last big analog effects films uh, just before the onset of digital compositing and cgi and all this because everything you see in this is miniatures and mm -hmm. it's incredible i mean it's really incredible if you watch some of the behind the scenes stuff uh, the visual effects supervisor on this eric brevig and his team they used real-time motion control to combine shots of actors filmed in front of a blue screen with matte painting and these, I say miniatures, they're, they're giant miniatures. I mean, taking up entire sound stages of these, this like red cratered landscape of Mars. It's really uh, incredible work. Mm. And uh, in fact, one of my favorite shots that, that I saw how they did the, the scene where you've got the, the train, you know, moving through Mars and it, and it cuts to the outside of the train. You see Arnold inside uh, like yeah. looking out the window and then the camera pulls back to show the train going across the Martian landscape yeah. that the way that they got an image of Arnold inside of that is they actually put a small back projected screen inside of the train. So there's this like screen that's like, like eight inches wide and they had filmed the, the shot of Arnold and put and projected that inside of the train. So that wasn't like composited in, Wow. Like it was there in real time inside of that train, like a video of Arnold being projected inside of it to make it look like he's inside of that train. Oh, that's wild. Uh, it's really cool. It's, it's really amazing. Cool. Just like looking at the, I mean, just in, when they're even walking through the caverns for like the reactor and even and in those landscapes, I mean, there's a lot of effects work that went into, I mean, they're on screens. I mean, you know, as far as like further out into the landscape yeah. and stuff. So they do a great job of making it feel genuine and huge like especially in those caverns they said that was really important they wanted to make sure that it felt like this reactor was huge enough like very is like obviously he's like you wanted it to be big enough that it felt like this is a machine large enough to be able to create an atmosphere in mars in like three seconds he says which is obviously ridiculous but <laughs> if there was such a thing right. maybe it would somewhat look like this so we also had behind the camera frequent Verhoeven cinematographer, Joost Vacano. We talked about him last week a little bit. And then another returning collaborator was effects designer, Rob Botin. You know, we talked about him on RoboCop. He had created yeah. some pretty memorable effects for that film, including, you know, the RoboCop costume. Uh, but they were nothing compared to the size of the work required for Total Recall. Uh, mm. For this film, he had to create stuff like a mutant woman with three boobs, <laughs> a man with a deformed twin growing out of his chest, a female head that lifts off in this horizontal cross section to reveal Schwarzenegger's head underneath and the distorted faces and bulging eyes of, uh, of characters suffering from depressurization. And they're pretty, it's incredible work. Honestly. Lots of puppets. Yeah. Just Lots like, of puppets. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Arnold head that's, you know, when that, when the woman's head splits off the Arnold head underneath is a puppet. And you, if you're looking at it close enough, you can tell, but the, the great thing about that scene is that you're watching the mask because of the movements. You're watching it come apart and go together. So your eyes are kind of drawn away from the actual Arnold mask underneath it. So you're just kind of seeing it almost in your peripheral vision. So it, it's uh, the fact that it's a puppet is not as 
obvious. Same mm-hmm. thing with uh, Kuato later on, because the body when you when Kuato is like a fully articulated pup, obviously that's the puppet that's moving. But when you see him like up close, the whole body is a puppet. Like the actor's not there. There's a puppet that's made to look like that actor, but they kind of keep his face a little bit out of focus in the background. So you're just focusing on Kuato. So they really not only made great special effects, but they shot them in ways, I think, that made them even more believable. That's a really good point because one of the big ones for me always that I remember is the removing the tracker uh, up his nose. And so that's a puppet as well and yep, that's an but they shoot it in too. such a way that it's like close up on his face just mm-hmm. enough that it you can't tell you know like yeah, it's yeah, uh, it's yeah. pretty good yeah and it makes me think of almost of the uh, peter weller puppet from robocop 2 honestly oh yeah for um, sure which i don't know if botine did that one but that one was a really good puppet too uh ron Chusette claims that he had two people ask him if they really got a siamese twin for kuato which is one of the many quotes from she said that makes me think that he is often full of shit (laughs) (laughs) because because there's no fucking way that somebody asked him that (laughs) uh yeah that's that's weird so So, but but anyway for their for their work on the film botine and brevig were both awarded uh an oscar for special achievement and visual effects so they they got an oscar for their work on this film it's fantastic all the way around you can tell obviously that verhoven and uh arnold loved the robocop folks because it was like you said a lot of people from robocop uh starship and uh, starship troopers and hollow man really like uh you mentioned yeah. just vacano uh or yost or whatever he's always veroven's guy for like the whole time uh, so yeah. we'll see him over and over again bill sandell uh i mentioned him earlier but he's on robocop production designer yeah he was on robocop's production design uh he was like an art department guy for like all kinds of 70s exploitation movies and stuff so mm. it's interesting to see what he moved into uh erica phillips was the costume designer on robocop she came back for this one and uh and then there's uh frank urosti who's the editor yeah, the editor yeah yeah and uh he's a he was an arnold and verhoven guy uh i yeah. was looking through his stuff because i was like man people think editors don't do anything but there's got to be a reason this guy keeps getting chosen but if you look at his editors do more than almost anyone else on a movie to be honest yeah <laughs> yeah like they're they're the reason that they're they're a large part of why a movie works or doesn't work mm. so l- listen to this i'm just gonna read through it this is 84 through 99 for Eurosti. it's uh conan the destroyer red sonia the hitcher robocop die hard roadhouse total recall basic instinct cliffhanger tombstone terminal velocity C- cutthroat island executive decision conspiracy theory lethal weapon Four, deep blue sea so he's just like Lots of fun movies. That, uh, yeah, lots of fun stuff. And then we also on this one, uh, this is, I think, Verhoeven's first collaboration with uh, Jerry Goldsmith. Who he wanted uh, originally for Flesh and Blood, apparently. and yeah. uh, But he, for whatever reason, he was tied up. So he had to go with, uh, I believe it was Basil Podoris. Podoris, yeah, who did Robocop, yeah. yeah yeah and so yeah who, and, who came back and did robocop too yeah so he yeah. came back and did robocop and uh jerry jerry goldsmith is a rock star during this oh time, he's a legend right? man and, and another there's your another star trek reference for you todd because he did a shit ton of star trek movies oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> he was in rambo alien star trek uh yeah and uh he says he received a lot of criticism in this movie that it didn't have a theme uh but he says he strongly disagrees with that that uh it did have a theme but it wasn't the kind of theme that made people leave the theater like whistling in afterwards but he had modeled a lot of interesting enough or ironically enough he had modeled a lot of this movie's score after the score from conan the barbarian which was composed by basil podoris yeah yeah (laughs) the uh nice but yeah i mean uh he he considers this film one of his uh best scores that he's ever done i think it's a great score i think the open i think the opening theme when you've got the like the title screen. I think that's really outstanding. And he comes back to work with Verhoeven on basic instinct and hollow man later on. Yeah. He does a good job with like, especially in Mars, like the wonder of everything Mm -hmm. and like that, which I mean, obviously he's used to that kind of shit. So it makes sense. Oh, another story, but back to your for a second. He, he definitely was one of the ones that Arnold helped out uh, because in, 
and uh, I think it's a feature on the DVD, Imagining Total Recall or something like that. He said uh, most of those external shots of Mars almost didn't happen. Um, or they didn't make it into the final cut of the movie. And he was like super disappointed about that. Because the producer started to feel like they would be too expensive and go over budget. Uh, and then so he called Arnold and told him. And so then all of a sudden they were able to do it. So <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I have a and, feeling you know, a lot of I have a feeling a lot of those stories were like, yeah, we ran into problem X Y Z whatever. I called Arnold, and then we were able to do it. <laughs> Arnold, fi- Arnold's a fixer. Yeah. <laughs> he's, a, he's a fixer. Uh, he's a problem solver. So, as had been the case on RoboCop, Total Recall was initially given an X rating for its violent content, uh, forcing Verhoeven and Frank Urosti to trim down the length of certain shots to make them a bit less graphic. Uh, some of the shots that had to be shortened included one of a drill boring into a man's stomach. And so what's his name? Benny, I think. It's yeah, just, Benny. Oh, yeah. And then, um, you know, Michael Ironside's arms being chopped off in an elevator and then a man's body being used as a human meat shield for bullets and a shootout <laughs> on an escalator, which is fucking brutal in yeah. the film. It's, it's right uh, there with the Ed 209 kill. Yes, from it's Robocop. sort of hilarious in, in the same way that Ed 209 is. Like, it's sort of hilarious. Like, uh, they just Verhoeven just uses the biggest squibs <laughs> possible. Yeah. Like you don't just get hit with a bullet. Like bullets explode out of your body. Uh, <laughs> it's it's sort of it's so over the top that it is funny. Like it was in in the two hundred nine scene. Yeah, and it's it's even crazier to think about. This isn't an innocent bystander. This is a guy that just. What happened he to be on the the wrong place. So yeah. just trying to shot. Arnold's using him as a human shield. <laughs> just like to shoot well, I think he had already guy. gotten shot. I think, he I was think probably, you're right. And so Arnold's like, well, I might as well use this guy's meat to keep me from getting <laughs> shot. But yeah, there's a bunch of those scenes that got uh, clo- uh, like tribbed up at least because of the critics, but or, or I mean, because of the MPAA. Uh, another another story, by the way, like Todd was mentioning, is there's probably a lot of these stories. Um, when they when they finished this movie and uh, started doing the uh, uh, campaign for it, the original trailer, a lot of the people working on the movie felt it was really bad and like completely misrepresented the film. Um, and Arnold felt like it didn't represent the quote scope and weirdness of this movie. And uh, I think it was TriStar that distributed it or something like that. And uh, I feel like that's what they said, but I don't, maybe that doesn't make sense. Anyway, um, he called up the producers and made them watch the film, said, you need to sit down and watch, actually watch this movie. And then showed them the trailer again and was like, uh, you're selling this film short on the, on, on everything. And so he asked them to make a brand new campaign. So uh, it was at like a because he he was pissed because at the time the movie had like on the uh, polling it had like a forty three percent public awareness and he said that that is absolutely disastrous and unacceptable and so he made the producers do this they they agreed they started a whole new campaign with a brand new trailer uh, and uh, per- convinced Carlco to pump in more money for advertising and uh, so by the time the movie. Uh, released it was up to a 99 percent in public awareness wow but again uh arnold schwarzenegger asserting himself into the yeah. there. <laughs> hey he likes to he, he likes to he's a he likes to be a winner essentially yeah. and he's going to do everything it takes to make that happen uh, so it, at the time that it was being screened for critics a lot of uh, critics of the film accused it of making violence fun and funny because it has like some signature Arnold one-liners and a considerable body count, 74 deaths in this movie, which gives it an average of one death every 90 seconds. So, <laughs> uh, but uh, true to his style, Verhoeven's go- goal wasn't to exploit violence, but to show it as horrific. You know, we talked about that back in our first episode on this series, how he wants you to feel the violence. He doesn't want it to just be a throwaway, like in Star Wars when somebody gets shot with a blast or whatever, and then it doesn't seem to matter. Like, it doesn't seem to matter. Uh, it's the kills in this movie are not bloodless and weightless. Uh, they have an impact to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also critics womp womp. Yeah. Bring something new. <laughs> that's, that's always going to happen with Verhoeven, but I will say yeah. this in that commentary, they do laugh a lot for, you know, 
for Verhoeven not to get a little bit of a kick out of it. Like, oh, uh, it's at, fun. And Arnold too, like when they, uh, when the three boob lady like walks away and uh, Ironside or whoever shoots her, and then they're like Arnold's just like, <laughs> he's so crazy because he shot a woman and not just shot the one. <laughs> he shot her in the back. That's wild. You just don't do that anymore in the field. He shot her in the back. <laughs> But they're goofy like that throughout that entire commentary. Like, uh, <laughs> like there's, I mean, there's weird, there's weird stuff where you're like, you can tell they're joking, but like when Sharon and Arnold have the, uh, uh, the hotel scene, like when he first wakes up, you know, after having the dream of Mars and stuff, and he's yeah. like, oh, you remember when we did this and we went up, we went into the hotel room and then we're up there just like begging around and like practicing fight scenes and like the lovemaking and people probably thought it's a kinky Hollywood people, you know? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and Verhoeven's like, yeah, and then she's like there and she's, she's really timid here, only pushes you one string on her lingerie. I could not get her to do more, uh, but I got my revenge in the next movie, you know. <laughs> wow. Oh my god! <laughs> but they're like, uh, and then I mean, it's like that through the whole thing. Like the Verhoeven is like telling a story at the time he kills Sharon Stahl, and so like Arnold's like, wait, 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 don't, don't, don't skip over the fact that you hit that line. Uh, consider that the divorce. That's, <laughs> that's such a great, brilliant line. I, I the, that is one of my famous one line. Consider that the divorce. Consider that the divorce. That is one of my lines. <laughs> people, people love it. <laughs> it is. It's a great line. <laughs> and, then, and then Verhoeven's like talking about it. it's like so. Basically, he shoves off the air, and then it is murdering all of these people, which I'm sure that uh, they would consider this collateral damage. Ah, that's what movie I did. I did collateral damage. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but uh so, yeah and I, even I, in like the jotty cab like when it <laughs> drives on the wall and blows up they're just like arnold's like yeah i just love i love it i love these movies so much they're like why is he explosive i don't know blowing up <laughs> <laughs> uh that's hilarious you know who plays the johnny cab yeah well i guess this is a great time to bring that up isn't it todd yeah. i'm gonna recommend that we just start having a uh just a, a, another segment of the show called <laughs> who's in star trek who's in star trek <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so, I mean, like you have to look these up for now okay yeah. <laughs> i'll do it because I, I don't I, I just stumbled across it but yeah you know obviously uh in this one we know roddy cox is in there again mm -hmm. uh yeah, yeah. who was captain jellico and uh there's uh mark alimo who is uh, Gold Ducat in Deep Gold Space Ducat. Nine. Yeah. Uh, and then if you want off roles in the Next Generation, and Lysia Nath, who is the three boob lady, mm -hmm. she plays Ensign Sonia Gomez in the Next Generation. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah she spills coffee on Picard. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> But who Justin was referring to was Robert Picardo. Who is the doctor oh in my Voyager? God, yeah. yeah, he's doctor, and uh, so he was the facial model and the voice of the Johnny Cab. Yeah, he used to do a lot of that kind of work. Enjoy um, the ride. You know those critics that that were kind of you know, accusing the film of making fun of violence and stuff. I, I think by focusing on that, they seem to have missed a lot of the other layers that Verhoeven was working on here. You know that duality of Doug Quaid, that the very Philip K. Dickian kind of uh, idea of identity, the colonization of Mars by a greedy corporation, which is very similar ground to what kind of what, what Robocop did. Mm. But most critics did enjoy the film when it came out and, and it received generally positive reviews. Roger Ebert called it quote, one of the most complex and visually interesting science fiction movies in a long time. But I am, um, you know, we've been doing this long enough to where I, I, I think it's a pretty safe bet that there are people on the internet who don't share those views, Gary. Well, it's always fun, Justin, to take a look back at a movie like this from the early 90s and really just think about what the critics might have been thinking and take a look now and see as brand new audiences or people are revisiting the movie and you might say totally recalling it and finding out that they all <laughs> need a nap. So, our Dylan Beck says, 
uh, his, his review is titled Bad Language Gross Creatures. And all it says is overuse of profanity and obscenity. This movie is a nightmare. That's it. Oh. <laughs> Uh, Tommy Tomato says, this really is a terrible movie. Arnold Schwarzenegger just can't act, and everything is just one big mess. 13-year-old boys are going to love it for the triplets. <laughs> uh, this one says, this movie was awful, unless you like gore, blood, foul language, poor acting. I guess that's the way they made movies back then. Needless to say, the remake's good, and thankfully nothing like the original. Wow. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's weird, but uh, joke's on you, pal. I love all of the other things you mentioned. I know, yeah, I'm a big fan of all of that. <laughs> uh, uh, this one's from uh, Rajavalu Chandrasekharan. Uh, he says, what an ugly fuck. Moving to Mars on a fucking train? That's through and enough bullshit. You think you fucked my mind? Well, go fuck yourself. Wow. <laughs> uh Vincent says oh my god what the fuck please shut the go fuck off please why what the fuck 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 that's i and i read every what the fuck <laughs> thank you <laughs> we appreciate uh, this your review diligence. is titled get your ass to mars <laughs> mahs Every so often, I'll watch some revered cult movie and come away utterly baffled. So I'll just go ahead and ask, how does anyone like Total Recall? I mean, I understand why teenagers would, but how does a movie like this get the kind of acclaim and reputation that it has? I think Paul Verhoeven was occasionally getting too much credit for making science fiction films that dabble in social commentary. whoop de fucking do that's what science fiction does. Space <laughs> Mutiny does that. Having the skill to make a clever or genuinely satirical commentary is something else entirely. Verhoeven fared somewhat better with Robocop a few years earlier and would have much better luck with Starship Troopers, but luck eludes him entirely in Total Recall. It's cheap looking and largely unimaginative throughout, despite a great, if I'm not me, then who the hell am I premise from the Philip K. Dick story, we can remember it for you wholesale. But a big reason it fails is the casting of Arnold Schwarzenegger. David Cronenberg was originally slated to direct with William Hurt in the starring role, which gives you an idea of what it could have been. Schwarzenegger has a weird charm, but a role like this of a man caught between reality, second guessing himself at every turn, requires the sort of nimbleness that his bull in a china shop act acting is incapable of. The one-liners and extremely graphic violence are all Verhoeven, but the film's most effective element is almost surely a leftover from Cronenberg's time on the project, a mutant rebel with a growth on his stomach that his, is his living half-formed psychic Siamese twin. That's creepy, unique, and mesmerizing. But that's the only time Total Recall is any of those things. But if you can derive enjoyment from Arnold shouting, screw you, as he kills a man with a giant screw, then fine, watch this. You not get enjoyment out of that, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> what what uh, kind of sad human being are you? Yeah. Uh, this one says, a huge disappointment, a large part, a total disgrace to the science fiction community. This film is plagued with mindless violence, very, very loose plot, pointless encounters with bad guys, and horrible acting. Not to say that Arnold Schwarzenegger is bad. Just this film, if you like good science fiction, please, for your own sake, try a Terminator film instead. Uh, and I'm going to Terminator read. film? Huh? Any, any Terminator, Terminator film? film? Yeah, any Terminator film. This one is just funny to me because it, it, this is the last one. He gave it one and a half stars so you can reconcile this in your brain because I'm going to read it to you because I can't tell if he loves it or hates it. And uh, it reminds me of Todd, so I feel like I'm going to read it. So Because <laughs> like uh, he also misses this name. When Arnold writes Melinda, when Arnold oh. writes Melinda to prove he's the author of the original note, he uses a black Sharpie with a red cap on it. Who puts a red cap on a black Sharpie? What type of lawless wasteland is it they're trying to create in a dystopian 2084? Fantastic practical effects. This team went on a nearly went to some nearly unimaginable lengths in order to create that blistering Arnold head gag. Oh, and that three boobed lady gag, that's a good one. Also worth mentioning, the cinematography here is something special. The set design is through, thorough and detailed. The costuming is great. The coloration is up there with Blade Runner. Shot selection and camera work are geared for action. Coincidentally, some of the most 90s-esque displays of this movie. 
The writing wasn't all there, but what did we expect in 1990? Sure, there are some plot holes and some unnecessarily corny dialogue, but I'll take this, I'll take that as a byproduct of a movie that took some gigantic filmmaking risks. This had to be an incredibly expensive flick to make, and for me, it really pays its dividends. Total Recall feels incredibly otherworldly, and the world building that they fully committed to here is remarkable, not to mention how much of this movie stands the test of time. See you at the party, Richter, deserves its place in film history. One and a half stars. That's pretty, you think they just only gave it one and a half stars because of the Sharpie thing? <laughs> because they seem to really like it i just need an explanation that was the final one i was like that guy's also that's what's even weirder because that's on the level of like a professional reviewer speaking about this film and gave it uh, aiden feely was this person's name and he gave it one and a half stars weird (laughs) i don't know you know the thing with i think a lot of verhoven movies and is that I think there are folks that are going to dismiss movies like RoboCop and Total Recall and Starship Troopers uh, before they even see it because they're going to judge them based on like their title. We saw that a lot with RoboCop um, or their premise or the whoever stars in it, you know, which I think is the case with this movie as well. I think people prejudge it with like preconceived notions of what a Arnold Schwarzenegger like action movie is going to be but Verhoeven here's the thing with Paul Verhoeven Paul Verhoeven is smarter than most of us Uh, remember Paul Verhoeven has a PhD in mathematics and physics Paul Verhoeven is a literal genius Uh, and what he does with his movies I think is he he, he makes very smart very smart movies that have the facade of dumb Hollywood movies does that make sense? Yeah. Like they've got they've got that sheen of, of a dumb Hollywood movie, but if you really are watching it and looking below the the absolute top surface, like there's a lot more going on. Uh, and Total Recall is not; it doesn't do that to quite the extent that RoboCop and even Starship Troopers do, I think. But you can appreciate Total Recall on a lot of different levels. I think you, you can watch it as a straight up. 80s action movie. I mean, yeah, it came out in 1990, but this is an 80s action movie. This is one of the last big 80s action movies. Uh, And and if you watch it that way, it's one of the best ones there is. Uh, It's got those iconic Arnold one-liners, like consider a divorce being probably my favorite one. Uh, It's got these great fights, like like the one where Schwarzenegger and Sharon Stone just beat the absolute shit out of each other. Uh, It's got really fun gory gunfights it's got limbs being ripped off it's got a hooker with three boobs it's got people's faces exploding like what is not to like about it like as a piece of sheer spectacle as a as an action movie it's sort of a masterpiece but we know by this point in our Ver- Paul Verhoeven series that Verhoeven doesn't just do anything that works on a single level he's not working just at face value on any of his movies so of course you know total recall isn't just an action movie it's also like a complete philip k dickian mind fuck and it works very well on that level i think there's there's there there literally is like several levels you could look at this movie on or, or, or different paths you could take about what this movie is all about and uh i kind of dig that about it um Speaking of smart, I don't know how I went down this rabbit hole, but I ended up, I I swear to God, I uh, was reading something about Arnold and stumbled upon uh, and got curious. You know, the average IQ, like 68% of people is like their IQ is between 85 and 115, I think. And Arnold's is like 130 something. Wow. And uh, like Sharon Stoltz is like 160 or something like that so just throwing that out there uh for as much as we like to have fun with arnold he's apparently a very intelligent man anyway but yeah no i mean this this movie works for me on like a god i read so many different things where i think people even took it further than i would have but i think the movie captures the concept uh when i was looking a little bit like we can uh we can recall it for you wholesale or whatever the name of the, the book was uh, or he can remember it for you wholesale. You know, that, that whole story seems to be a lot about humans trying to figure out the underlying thing is like, who am I really? And where am I going? And what's 
you know, what's the purpose and that sort of thing. Um, I feel like this movie, for better or worse, in your opinion, I mean, it gets that part. Like, it still understands the heart of the story. Like, I mean, you've got this guy yeah. that, depending on how you want to view the film, he he is possibly a working class person that is just like thinking about how much more they could be or, uh, you know, just wanting more out of their life or something like that. So, I mean, I don't know. I feel like that discussion is still there. Yeah, I think so too. And I do, I do think the one thing that does hurt that the, the, the ability to watch it both ways, you know, is the casting of Arnold. Cause he's a little, it's a little hard to believe that he's not, like a secret agent, super spy kind of guy because he looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know? Uh, so it, it like he's going like, to struggle with that short D- Danny DeVito dude. Like right, at any point, right, that's yeah. his buddy who works working with, yeah. or even Michael Ironside for that matter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, that that's the one thing that kind of harms that viewing of it. But if you look past that, I mean, this works very well. Like this is, you know, this is not the first Philip K. Dick adaptation. That distinction goes to Blade Runner. But I think it's one of the quintessential Philip K. Dick adaptations with all of the kind of questioning of reality that we've come to expect from him. And it also foreshadows future kind of very kind of mindfuck films like Inception, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And of of course, probably the biggest one is The Matrix. Uh, There's even a moment in this movie where uh, Dr. Edgemar offers Quaid a red pill, a pill that will supposedly bring him back to reality. And that had to be, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so that had to be a uh, on the forefront of of the Wachowskis' mind when they were creating that scene in the Matrix. Uh, you really feel that way. Is very Philip K. Dickian inspired. Well, what about when Sharon Stone tries to fuck him one more time, but only because the bad guys are coming? And he looks back in the monitor, and sees it, and he turns around. And he's like, "Clever girl." <laughs> you think Jurassic Park? Like yeah, I think, that's where they got it this. Mm-hmm. I think that's exactly what it was. <laughs> they modeled the Velociraptors <laughs> after Sharon Stone. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Uh, there's a lot of really heavy stuff here, though, that you could really like, you could talk about the, the questioning of reality ideas in this movie for hours. Like it's, it's very like stoner college dorm stuff. Uh, but it's, it's like, it's fascinating, honestly. And uh, I think the movie does a great job of presenting that while also just being really fun. If you just want to watch it as a really fun action movie with killer effects and, you know, great creatures. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, I mean, it's got all those things that just make it one of those classics that, you know, even if it's on, you know, TBS or something, you're, you're going to stop and watch. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's just incredibly well made. It's well directed. Yeah, uh, you know, the the production design that we've already praised is incredible. The pacing of the film, and a lot of that credit has to go to Frank uh, Ur- Uriosti, uh, the editor. Uh, the pacing of this film is incredible. Like it moves along at a clip from the get go. It is like a nonstop chase. It is, and it's like it hits these new plot points. Uh, at just the right moments, even when it has to give like exposition, it does it in a way that's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Like by having Quaid talk to himself from like a video recording or having Kuato deliver it in a way that's very compelling just because it's coming from Kuato, <laughs> you know, stuff that could be considered just boring forced exposition becomes a, a compelling moment of the film. Otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So we, we talked about the critics earlier, you know, and, and we, we went through all of our, you know, somebody needs a nap, internet critics, armchair critics. You know who else was a, um, a critic of the film? As the guy who almost directed it, David Cronenberg. Uh-oh. Uh, so I'm going to read a, a fairly long quote, but this is what Cronenberg had to say about the final product. I thought it was a bad movie, although there were t- one or two moments that were true Philip Dick moments in it. They were good. But they weren't good because it was Schwarzenegger still. First of all, as an actor for that kind of role, and secondly, as that character. The whole point of that character was that he was a unique, shy, mild character. They tried to compensate by making him a construction worker, but they gave him this beautiful Sharon Stone wife. I thought it was very visually tacky and messy. Verhoeven didn't do a good job with all the effects and all the mutants and all that stuff. They went for the action stuff purely, and that was it. It was an action gimmick. 
So I didn't really like the movie and I didn't think much of it, but by the time I saw it, I didn't care. I was over it. It, I, 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 I love, I will say I love um, David Cronenberg as a director, but I think he is dead wrong on that. I mean, just, yeah. this, just the, the, to say that like Verhoeven didn't do a good job with the effects and the mutants, like what movie did you watch? You know, yeah. like these look, this looks great. This look great. They, maybe they're not on the level of some of the effects in, in, uh, in Cronenberg's movies, which I would just about agree with. I mean, they're not quite on that level, but they're still pretty damn good, yeah. you know? Uh, and, and the whole like, I, I I do I already said this, but I do kind of agree with his point about Schwarzenegger. Although as we've discussed, this movie wouldn't exist without Schwarzenegger. But the whole idea of giving him the Sharon Stone looking wife, like you know, if they're going to try to keep a guy satisfied with the life that he has, give him a wife that looks like Sharon Stone doesn't doesn't hurt. Makes you <laughs> not question things. Yeah, like yeah, let's just go with it. If this is my with, wife. I'm fine. It's fine. With this. Yeah, I'll take it. I'm fine with this version of reality. (laughs) I'll go construction work shit and come home to Sharon Stone. Yeah, everything (laughs) will be fine. (laughs) Uh, Uh, I I hate this criticism because the effects criticism I absolutely hate because I saw that a bunch in the reviews and I didn't even want to give it the time of day because it's so stupid to me because I'm like, in what world are these cheap effects? Like there's yeah, no, there's yeah. no world that that ex- that that's a thing. These effects are top notch, like the best of practical effects as far as anything that they were ever to accomplish. I think they could do better now, but nobody wants to do it anymore. But yeah. uh, but these are fantastic effects. So you're uh, immediately right off the bat, you're going to tell me it's like poor poor special effects. I'm, I'm writing that off. That's bullshit. But uh, also, look, man, I'm I'm a Oh, this is uh, that you know, I'm not trying to make this political, but I'm just saying, like, in, in general, I try to be like a pretty in moderation guy. Like, it's like, uh, you know, I know why the people hate the movie that hate it, like Dan O'Bannon and and uh Cronenberg. They want Philip K. Dick, they want the intelligent sci fi that Philip K. Dick writes, and I get that, and that makes a lot of sense. And you want it to be an accurate representation of his work. But like Justin pointed out, this movie doesn't work if, or doesn't happen if Arnold Schwarzenegger's not involved. And it doesn't work in the same way if Arnold Schwarzenegger's involved. But you can get kind of close. You can get pretty decently close, but people are going to expect something out of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And that's going to be the action side of things. And you know what? Arnold Schwarzenegger's hot. And if you want your thing to be the biggest thing that, not hot like that, Todd, I see your face. Um, (laughs) But but also hot like that. Uh, <laughs> if you want to, if you want to see, if if you want to see this movie get the highest possibility of reaching the broadest audience possible, Arnold Schwarzenegger is your man anyway, and he's on board, and he's on board for the right reasons. You know, Arnold's like trying to do it because he's not like wanted to be like buff action star the whole time. At no point in this movie is there, well, I guess at the beginning when he wakes up from his dream, but other than that, there's not like Arnold flexing his fucking muscles throughout the film. It's like Arnold wearing long sleeve shirts the entire time. Like he's except when he's construction working, showing off those bulging muscles. Oh yeah, he does do it there too. Okay. So (laughs) at the very beginning you get the the you get the for the ladies, you get the (laughs) here's your buff Hardy. But uh but otherwise, like he's he's it's not about that. It's about like a dude who's, you know, dealing with the things he's dealing with. Anyway, point is, I'm saying what's so wrong with maybe maybe this movie reaches a mass audience and they become obsessed with sci-fi. Maybe they want to read the book that this movie is based on. Maybe, yeah. you know, like maybe it's okay to like dilute the medicine a little bit. And, uh, you know, feed it to them. Spoonful of sugar? Is that what, is yeah, that what so I'm saying. <laughs> Total Recall can be a little spoonful of sugar for some hardcore sci-fi if you want it to be. And yeah. so uh, there's nothing wrong with that. This movie no, is exactly all. what it should have been given the circumstances. Well, yeah. I think uh, I, Justin and I were actually, I mentioned this to Justin uh, yesterday off mic. We were uh, we were at a place and we were talking about Philip K. Dick and someone had uh, done an unabridged translation of uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And they had done an unabridged version in comic book form and it makes it almost unreadable. And I was like, so some of these kind of have to go through change for it to be 
even workable in another medium. So for, you know, to do a direct translation of this is just not going to have the effect, the desired effect that you would if you put Arnold Schwarzenegger in it or give it some, some, some wild creature effects, you know, and it just, but it may draw people to that original story. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the film, you know, when it came out, it was a major financial success. It came in number one at the box office when it was released. It came out on June 1st, 1990. It actually knocked the record-breaking Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles out of that top spot. Uh, and it would go in. It would go on to bring in over $260 million worldwide during its theatrical run. Now, if, if a movie like this were made today, with that, that kind of success, it would be pretty much guaranteed to get a sequel. Like, they would have greenlit a sequel the, the second week of its release. But Hollywood was a much different place in 1990 uh, and sequels were not always a given. I mean, there were successful sequels like with Star Wars, uh, specifically with Star Wars prior to this, but it was honestly really James Cameron who turned the sequel game into what we kind of see it as now with Aliens and which Aliens had just come out. So that had the tide had started to turn, but he solidified it two years after this with uh with terminator 2 and then holly was like well look how much money we can make if we go back to the well but in 1990 when this came out that wasn't necessarily the case so the sequel wasn't guaranteed uh and none of the ma- major players involved uh with the first total recall wanted the sequel back then they didn't really think that the franchise lent itself to a sequel uh goldman and Shuset wanted a sequel and they had an idea but their interest kind of fell on deaf ears nobody who could have helped get it made really cared to do it and then in the early 1990s after the, re- the release of this film gary goldman optioned another philip k dick story called minority report with the hopes to direct it himself as a low budget feature he actually asked paul verhoven if he would attach himself as an executive producer hoping that the weight of verhoven's name would help to move the project forward uh, and Verhoeven reads the short story. He liked it. He agreed to help out. But then he suggested to Goldman that the short story might actually work as a sequel to Total Recall. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, which is, it's really interesting. If you've seen the eventual adaptation of Minority Report that Steven Spielberg directed much later, then you know how the story goes. Uh, in, it's a, in the future. There are certain people who are born with telepathic powers, which leads the government uh, leads to the government forming this new anti-crime organization called the Pre-Crime Division, which uses these telepaths, which they were called precogs in the story, uh, used them to predict illegal activities and arrest would-be criminals before any crime is actually committed. So the idea was, you know, in Total Recall, the movie version, there was this idea introduced that the mutants, or at least some of them, were clairvoyant. I mean, Kuato is clairvoyant. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the idea to use Minority Report as a sequel to Total Recall would see Quaid, who after the events of the first film is now, he he is now a police officer. He's a law enforcement officer and he's heading up the pre-crime division with mutants essentially standing in as the story's precogs. And in this version, it kind of sounds like Quaid is is a version of the character that, that, that Tom Cruise plays in Steven Spielberg's film. That's 100% yeah. confirmed in the commentary for the film. Uh, Verhoeven actually discusses it in there uh, with Schwarzenegger. And they say that, yeah, it, it's, uh, they particularly discuss it during one scene um, that, yeah, it would be that Quaid on Mars goes on to start a company. He, he runs a corporation that runs the like pre-crime division, basically. Yeah. And uh, that, uh, the the predictor of this is actually besides Quato is when they're when he f- is on Mars and walking along and there's the woman and the little girl the woman that comes out and says yeah, would you like to know yeah. more about your future and he says and particularly that little girl that comes out and it's like I can tell you when your birthday is and uh, he stops with her and talks to her for a minute is like that's amazing and gives her some money but that was supposed to apparently according to them that was a hint towards it that that would be like a another step like that that yeah. quaid would eventually start a division that used well, these types yeah, of mutants in that way i don't think it was planned that way when the that was written maybe not the in original the original script. script yeah yeah idea. but that was an idea where they're like hey we did this in the original script let's roll with it mm. so ron Chusset was contractually obliged to actually write the first draft of any sequel 
uh, it, that was part of his contract. So he came on board and he and Goldman worked on a script. Uh, Arnold was attached to the star. Uh, Verhoeven was going to return to direct. Uh, but then after they finished the script, Carol Co. went bankrupt. And their financial situation was so bad that they actually reneged on their contractual payments to Shusette and Goldman. So they didn't, they didn't get paid for their work on it, which resulted in the ownership of the rights to both the short story and the first draft. They, those went back to the writers, to Shusette and Goldman, which allowed them to shop the project around and eventually move it to 20th Century Fox. So some time's gone by this. Verhoeven's already... Uh, He's already done Basic Instinct. He's already working on his next film. And according to Goldman, he had just kind of lost interest by this time. So this is like probably 93, 94. That's according to Goldman. Uh, that's not according to Verhoeven, though. He says something that kind of uh, contradicts that. Somebody whose name I won't name, without warning, took, a, took it away. Somebody who had me on their pay list like a Judas... So in some subversive ways, I think it left Caroco and it came into the hands of Jean de Pont. Yeah, so remember Jean de Pont, he, he's a fellow oh, sorry, Dutchman. I, I probably should have said Jan de Pont, but Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> he, that's right. He would have probably said it right. He would have probably said it right, yeah. <laughs> but Jan de Pont, a fellow Dutchman, he had uh, worked frequently with Verhoeven as a cinematographer. Uh, although at this point, he was trying to break in as a director, but had not yet made his 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 debut which would come in 1994 with speed hmm. so debont and the studio they had discussed working on total recall 2 uh working from the minority report idea but ultimately decided not to move forward with it as a sequel instead focusing on minority report for a standalone project nice nice Minority Report would end up in development hell for the next five years or so with Jan de Vaughan eventually jumping ship and moving on. Uh, so he had had, um, he had also had some big hits. You know, he had by this time had, uh, had, had already directed his first film speed and he had also done twister, which were both very successful, but then speed two and the haunting came out. They were not very successful. They, they both flat out bombed and Fox lost a little bit of faith with him. So the project was kind of falling apart until a few years later in 1998 or 1999 or so uh, when Steven Spielberg became attached to it, leading to a film in 2002, which grossed over $350 million worldwide. Um, I'm not going to talk too long about Minority Report, the actual movie that ended up, but I will say uh, I'm a huge fan of that film and it holds up incredibly well. It is yeah. really good. It's one of my favorites. I love it. <laughs> it's really great. So, and it came out of the perfect time in that like post 9 11 Patriot Act world. You know, oh, yeah. it wasn't necessarily intentional, but it, it hit harder because of when it came out. Yeah, it really absolutely. Did. I can imagine anyway. Steven Spielberg actually making something quality. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like, I mean, I, I, you know, it made $350 million worldwide, but that was actually considered underperforming. They had hoped, they, they had expected that movie to bring in like, like half a billion and it, it was actually considered a disappointing return on that movie and it feels like it's an underrated movie from spielberg but it's i think minority report is fucking great it is yeah. really good yeah uh that that scene with the spider robot things like that is intense and anyway yeah. i'm not gonna we'll do i'm sure we'll we'll have to cover minority report down the line you know, oh yeah <laughs> and really talk about it but in the, anyway in it. the have you really? You've never I've, seen it? I've never seen it. Gary. Oh, I seriously? just had to go oh ahead and be God. honest. I have yeah. to go ahead and be honest. I've literally never seen Minority Report. Gary, I don't know why. Your, that is part of your homework this week is to watch Minority <laughs> Report. It's a, it's a really a, an outstanding movie. So anyway, in, in the meantime, all this is happening. Uh, Carol Cole, uh, they, they, they went out of business. They sold the TV rights for Total Recall. Uh, which resulted in a short-lived Showtime series called Total Recall 2070. Uh, long, it lasted less than a season, I think. It didn't do very well. wasn't very well liked. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, then around 1997, Dimension Films, who had just scored a major hit with Wes Craven's Scream, acquired the sequel and remake rights to Total Recall and planned to move forward with a sequel with a brand new screenplay from Shusette and Goldman, which I won't summarize here. Uh, you can go read. You can read a lot of about a lot of the versions of a Total Recall sequel, including this one, in the book uh, "Tales from Development Hell." Uh, it was written by David Hughes, 
really good book. Uh, it's like 99 cents on Kindle. Uh, oh, wow. So it, I, I would highly recommend it because they've got an entire chapter about unmade versions of, of Total Recall. So I got a lot of information from them regarding that and regarding the unmade uh, David Cronenberg version. A lot of that came from that book. So nice. uh, yeah, big, big props to that book for helping us out on this episode. But uh, I'm not even going to cover all the versions of the sequel that they went through, but, but uh, David Hughes, he does summarize the scripts for all of them. It's really interesting. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so Sh- Shusette and Goldman write a script and it looked like it was a go. Everyone at Dimension loved the script. Uh, there was one person who didn't love the script and that's Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, we <laughs> talked about how Arnold Schwarzenegger can get, he can get a project going, but you know what, if he's not on board, it ain't moving. Yeah. So he, he thought the new story that they'd come up with, with was just too complicated. He thought it was too complex. The audiences would think it was too confusing. And without Arnold on board, the project just went into limbo. Uh, if this sequel had happened, though, it may have actually been directed by Jonathan Frakes, who had just directed Star Trek First Contact, which nice. did, did, had done well, grossed over $150 million. And he had apparently been in talks with Dimension about the sequel. God, that'd be awesome. Would yeah. it? Would it? I don't know. I don't know that it would. <laughs> I was gonna say. I listen. I love Star Trek. I love Jonathan Frakes, and I love uh, Number One was perhaps one of my favorite characters of Star Trek: The Next Generation. Director wise, I don't know. I've never seen him he's, do anything really. Well, except- let's say he's hit and miss as yeah. a director. Okay. He's he's a, he's, good, he yeah. is a big genre guy. That might actually be a fun series is some of the stuff Jonathan Frakes has directed. Of course. I mean, yeah, but it's been a lot of TV, but it's a lot yeah. of TV. Yeah. yeah. He did some Picard. It was good. Yeah. 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 But, but yeah, he's hit or miss as a director. I think anyway, this whole cycle kind of continues. Scripts are written some by Goldman and Shusset, some by other writers, but the project could just never get off the ground either because they couldn't get Arnold on board or because of the monetary stuff revolving around the budget and Arnold's fee couldn't get resolved. Uh, and then in 2003, Arnold Schwarzenegger became the governor of California, which put his acting career on hiatus for eight years. And during that time, focus on Total Recall changed from a sequel to a remake and in 2012 that remake was released with colin farrell in the lead role i know todd's a big fan of the remake Mm -hmm. um i saw it in 2012 i don't remember much about it except if i recall correctly they never even go to mars do they nope they don't yeah so uh, i remember it it does it's it's more uh geopolitical here on earth yeah i remember it being fairly bland but it's been almost a decade since i saw it so i can't say a whole lot about it that almost okay. sounds disappointing i would like to take a moment here if i could just to apologize to jonathan frakes i don't mean to criticize your filmography sir i appreciate you and he's not listening to this show who who am i to judge you i just want you to know that uh secondly i would apologize to the filmmakers involved with the remake of total recall who i know who none of you are i've never seen the movie i know that colin farrell is there uh i don't i don't know i did when i was watching this movie think colin farrell actually for the philip k dick version of the story like if you were really trying to hit that cronenberg thing like colin farrell i could totally see being that dude like he's sure, yeah. more he could be more average albeit good looking he could be the more average dude uh you know, who's not super buff superhero sure. Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I, I will say I do. Yeah. Along with that, um, having just watched it recently, uh, I, I definitely think Colin Farrell pulls off the paranoia side of it because, it, you know, right from the word go, there's a big side of that. And um, yeah. And that one's, you know, we talked about the cast of this one. That one follows suit. There's some really heavy players in that one. And Brian um, Cranston in it. Brian Cranston, yeah, yeah. absolutely. There's it just a bunch feels of people. like I don't know what the rules are for. This is probably a roundtable discussion, maybe for some day. Uh, but like the rules for remakes, like mm. I'm not, I'm not very anti. I mean, I'm not totally anti remake, and I'm not trying to get into the broader discussion of like should there be remakes and all oh, why. But but at a certain point, there was a there was a threshold we reached in time mm. where film. At least, well, you know what? Maybe it's just even our age. Maybe it's just for us that if you had like a three hundred fifty dollar million uh, million dollar film that was successful or whatever this movie made, uh, 
to maybe don't remake that within the next 15, 20 years. You know, yeah, like I mean, it had been 22 years by the time the remake came out. Well, shut up. This, this is my <laughs> point. <laughs> I'm just trying to say at some point, film just like stayed more. Another, I don't know. Another strong, like another strong point made by Gary Horn. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying, I feel like Total Recall, the reason I never saw it is I was like, I've seen Total Recall and it's got Arnold and he's badass. So yeah, screw but... you. I don't want to see it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, there's no need to remake it, but in Hollywood's eyes, you know, it's a recognizable IP and that's what Hollywood cares about these days, you know, mm. uh, that name recognition. So let's talk uh, further viewing guys. If you guys want to um, do a, a total recall double feature with uh, with another movie, what? I hate that you did that. Double feature? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are What are you pairing total recall with? Although it does sound like a good t-shirt idea. Maybe if you can just have something with like double feature on it. <laughs> I don't know how that's a good I don't know idea. But anyway, Todd, what yes. would you do as a, not and don't don't say the remake. That doesn't count. No. <laughs> what would you do? No, no. I know the rules. Recall? I know the rules. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, to be honest, you actually mentioned it earlier in the episode. Um pairing it with uh eternal sunshine of the spotless mind um yeah. although there's not the element of paranoia i think it's the as as palpable and just as strong um broken heart of yeah yeah those, and it also... of those characters dealing with the loss of the memory and then mm -hmm. once those things are slowly revealed throughout as we the audience travel through those memories um there you know that broken heart comes through and you just you just feel for those characters and i love the idea because so much of total recall was done in camera michel gondry is known for doing most of his stuff most of his special effects in camera and oh, yeah. i think eternal sunshine really showcases that in such a unique and creative way i think this would be a great pairing yeah yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really good one because you've got all that grappling with identity and everything as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I, I agree. Gary, what do you what do you think? Man, there's so many that you could pair with this movie. I mean, obviously, you could go with like what we've already talked about, like a Minority Report. Apparently, sounds like it would just it would be fun to watch it right after this movie if you're yeah, yeah. Do a double feature. Sure. I guess. Um, I. Uh, okay, so then also obviously I thought of the Matrix at one point yep. during this yeah. movie that that would work really well and blade runner so those are the obvious ones i'll tell you the three weird ones i think i thought of that i thought work really well with this are uh, uh elysium remember that movie oh yeah that feels yeah. really weird like where he goes up there there's like the other planet that's mm -hmm. like, i don't know oh something about that like uh made me think of it and uh i'm gonna get real out there on you first off i'm gonna say equilibrium um Cool. For some reason, that one, it, this felt like here's a, here's a weird um, connection. Equilibrium, the guy who wrote and directed that, Kurt Wimmer, wrote the screenplay for the Total Recall remake. Oh, oh wow. I know that. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> cool. Uh, the other one was one we watched, I, I say recently, because all of these that we do for the show feel recent. This is on the old show, but how about Johnny Mnemonic? I don't really? know why I thought of that movie, but I did. Johnny Mnemonic is very Philip K. Dick inspired, I would say. Yeah. So for me, I feel like obviously, yeah, Minority Report is the obvious one. Uh, there's plenty of other Phil Philip K. Dick adaptations that you could talk about. Um, you could do, hell, you could do Screamers and it could be Philip K. Dick as adapted by Dan O'Bannon again, you know, if, if you wanted mm -hmm. to do that. But uh, if I were going to do a Philip K. Dick double feature and other than Minority Report, which is the perfect, I think, one, two combo. Um, one that I feel like doesn't get discussed as much because it's a little more art housey, uh, A Scanner Darkly by Richard Linklater. Oh, um, Scanner Darkly. Yeah, it's, it's a really cool rotoscoped animated film starring Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves plays a cop who... Uh, he, he uses this like drug that kind of starts to make him lose his identity. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of that struggle with identity that's that's typical of Philip K. Dick and questioning of what's real and what isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so you get a lot of that same stuff in there as well. It's, uh, Scanner Darkly is very cool uh, if you ever get a chance to see it. It's Keanu Reeves, uh, Robert Downey Jr., 
Winona Ryder, Woody Harrelson. Like it's got a great cast. It's a incredibly cool to look at because yeah. of the the that rotoscoping animation that Link later did in mm -hmm. this and in Waking Life. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that that would probably be my pick for a uh, less obvious choice. I, Keanu Reeves, like getting uh, two shout outs there with Johnny Mnemonic and uh, yeah. Scanner Darkly uh, and the Matrix. <laughs> oh, and the Matrix all <laughs> yeah. all over this Arnold train. Look at yeah. that. Who who would have <laughs> thunk it? Uh, I have a I have something I want to tell you about Keanu Reeves, but remind me to tell you on our next episode. Okay, <laughs> like the next so, episode, the roundtable episode. Okay, okay. So in the interim, while Total Recall, uh, while the sequel to Total Recall was kind of being discussed and being worked on, Verhoeven had moved on to his next project. He had done, uh, he had been successful in science fiction. Uh, he had done two big sci-fi action movies back to back. So after doing that, he wanted to to do something smaller and more character-based for his next film. But in true Verhoeven fashion, going smaller didn't mean he was going to hold back uh, his, his tendencies. And his next <laughs> film would probably be the most controversial of his career in Hollywood so far. We're going to keep saying that because he, he I was about to say things up. <laughs> 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 and that movie uh, that we're going to be discussing on our next episode for the next part of our Paul Verhoeven series is... Verhoeven's 1992 thriller, Basic Instinct, uh, which I haven't seen in years, so I'm excited to watch it. Uh, I remember it being very good, so it we'll, should be I've fun to talk about, I think. I've never seen it, so this will be a first viewing. Oh, oh, there's so much to see, Todd. Well, that's next week. Uh, guys, tell everyone where you can be found on the internet. And this is Gary Horde on all the things. I have a wrestling show at TIPW Show. I have uh, this show. That's the only other thing I have, so I don't know what <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> anyway that's it uh you can find me and my star trek podcast the computer resume podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and uh we cover the how many times can you say podcast i don't know <laughs> oh my god that is i always like to think i have that really planned out i truly don't obviously now um but yeah if you like star trek come listen to me and a rotating panel of uh friends and comedians and podcasters talk trek uh, that's at computer resume on all of the socials and you can find me at mr todd a davis on all of the socials i am at justin underscore bishop twitter instagram letterboxd you can find the show at cinema underscore shock in all the usual places you can find us on facebook join our discord you can find all those links on cinemashock.net buy our merch all that shit leave us a review if you want i mean it'd be nice <laughs> and until next week May the wings of liberty never lose a feather. Thanks, excellent Jack Odinson. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. He did buy your shirt, didn't he? He did buy the shirt. May the wings of liberty never lose a feather. That's for you, baby. <laughs> and be excellent to each other. Johnny has the keys, and I got five kids to feed. <laughs> we didn't talk about Benny nearly enough on this. I know. Show. I know. He turns into great performance. I love that. Well, there's always. Yeah. Thank you.